Yeah, we've been doing Holy Week all week. Well, why is it different than the Christian? We go off a different calendar. What do you mean Christian one? The Orthodox is the original Christian. Is that what it is? Yeah, it's a big uh, 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 schism. Uh, uh, schism? Schism. Of 1054 is when they separated. Right? Nice. The East versus West. Orthodox in in Greek literally means the right way. The right way, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that. And and the Catholics, I've been doing it wrong universal, all these years. Universal, <laughs> so, yeah. So they don't agree on uh, when the Jesus was resurrected. Uh, on so sometimes it co- coincides, sometimes it's like a month and a half away. I mean the uh, spread. And sometimes just a week. Like, but you still you still celebrate Easter on Easter, don't you? Of course. I mean, I got you know. See, that's no fair. You get two holidays. Yeah, out two of Christmases, it. two Christmases. That's cheap. Two uh, Easters. I'm gonna turn. I'm gonna convert to Orthodox. You should. So I can come over. Get, you worried about your salvation? <laughs> so I hey, get do two. Do you have a minute to speak about our Savior, Jesus, uh, Lord Jesus Christ? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give you two minutes for that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to start. I, I don't think I, I'm going to use it, you know, the two minutes properly. I don't even know what to start. We're going to spread anyway. spread the word of Jesus here on uh, this episode of the AK Corner. And uh, we're going to educate people on the East German AK. And I'm looking forward to this because I'm hoping that uh, between James and Marco and Aura... I'm going to learn something. So what what got me interested in this was a blog. Uh, and, f- and for those that are listening that haven't checked out Factory 47 yet, you're doing yourself a major disservice. You need to go check them out, factory47.com. They are the, the makers of our talking lead. Of course, you didn't do this one, but I had this special made for a course that we did. Uh, Everywhere I go with those wearing those t shirts that I got. Uh huh. Everybody's like asking, especially that uh the Calumet. The Marine one. Where can I get one? Where can I get one? They're wildly popular, so go to Factory Forty Seven. Not only can you get the AK corner apparel, you can also get the major AK manufacturer logo factory uh, hats and shirts and and mugs. I don't know, tumblers, is that what you call them? Yeah. Yeah. This is one tumblers, for Mission First um, that I've got here, uh, M18 Smoke. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. I've never seen that before. Uh-huh. They're pretty sweet. You can get those at Mission First Tactical. Also a sponsor of the uh, Talking Lead AK Corner. Uh, so listeners, go go check out Factory 47. He also does a blog. And I don't know if you've got like a regular pattern that you're doing, or you just drop them whenever Not you feel at all. like it. Yeah, I just kind of whenever I there's like 20 that are in various stages of completion that I haven't finished. So thanks for reminding me. There you go. There you go. And as I, as I said, you can drop the AK Corner episodes on there too if you want to. Yeah, we need to do that. Feel feel free to do that. Um, but James Balzac is joining us, ladies and gentlemen. This yeah, is, thanks for having me. First again. First time this this year, season five, that yeah. James has, has jumped on. This is our third episode, and we're uh, proud as punch to have him on. So thanks for joining us, James. Thanks for having me. Also, returning guest from last <coughs> month, we've got our good buddy Marco Vorobiev join us. Marco, welcome in. So, nice to be here again. Nice to be us. Hey, did and, you get uh, your um, your belly band holster? Did it come I did. In? I ah. already tested it. You, you haven't tested it yet? Yes, I have. Ah, you like it? I loved it with the uh, Walter PPK, and I did not like it with the uh, Archon Type B. Those are two everyday carries for me. Yeah, is that? But a, the w- Walter is really good. The it the more really compact good. subcompact guns is is what it's really made for. Yeah, I don't guess you you uh, put the what's your pistol your big 
The one we talked about last week or last month? The Archon Type B? No. The Philly, oh, Stitchkin. Your Stitchkin, <laughs> yeah. I want to do an episode on that. That is an amazing gun. I did more research on it after our episode last month. Oh, you did? And, uh, yeah, I didn't realize it was a full auto pistol. Yeah, that's a full auto. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, I carried it for uh, almost a year. And uh, although it was like the the beauty queen at the range and stuff, and everybody, oh, man, let me shoot it, let me shoot it. I never had to use it in uh, in anger. In anger. <laughs> Were you ever? But I angry, have knocked though? down the targets at 200 meters and 250 meters. That thing on a regular basis. Oh, nice. Uh, on on semi-auto or full auto? Full auto, full auto with the uh, stock attached. Uh, pull it out. Pull it. Out. This is show and tell. Is that the Bakelite holster too? Right. So that this is a funny story actually. About this. So there. Um, they were uh, the the older models came with the wooden one, just like the C ninety six Mauser, uh-huh. you know the wood. And our new LT got that gun, and I carried this like I had almost like brand new with the with the Bakelite holster. And he would not freaking uh, relent. He would, uh, you, you know, you, you you don't really have, you know, you don't. You know, need to carry this. You can do this. So he tried to get me to swap him, and I and I just just because he was young LT and like still hasn't proven himself yet. He, uh, I just kind of freaking fucked with him. I said, <laughs> "No, sir. I mean, it's all written in my ID, uh, in my uh, ID card and all this." And then when I swapped the sniper rifle for uh, uh, the AK. And joined the assault group, fire assault group. So I had to turn this in. And literally the very next day, he's walking around the base <laughs> carrying my gun. Oh, that son of a bitch. Oh, look at that. That is sweet. Check that out, Jay. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So the holster you know, with this thing, it turns into the butt stop. Correct. Oh. Uh, so it, it's pretty. it's pretty sweet. So it just the butt the butt stock opens up and then you it serves as the holster. Yeah, hold that up again. Oh wow, that's awesome. That's wild. That's like some Jason Bourne stuff the right Stitchkin. there. Stitchkin. <laughs> Jason Bourne. <laughs> what was the caliber on that? Macro. It's the nine, nine by eighteen macro. Yeah, very nice. <clears throat> I dig it. I dig it. So uh, make sure you go back check out. Uh, last month's episode where we talked about Marco's book, we did a little deep dive into part of it. We didn't go the full book, but uh, we uh, deep dove into some specific areas. Um, and I, did you have anything about East Germany in here? Look at there. I, I think so, yeah. I, but it was like a part of a, a, a chapter. It wasn't a full chapter right. written on it. I may not have got to that yet, but um, also Brent, joining us, uh, Leadheads, is a fellow Leadhead, Nikolai Alpan. <laughs> That's close enough. Uh, also with his new company, 93 Tactical. Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay. 93 yeah. Tactical. And uh, tell our listeners about your new company. Uh, it's still in its infancy stages, uh, trying to figure some stuff out. But right now, I'm just kind of focusing on uh, making some custom patches here and there. I uh, got a few to, to give away this episode. Hold them up. Hold them up. Got your talking lead AK corner. I like it. I got like uh, it. black and tan. Black and tan. That's the way I like my drinks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was working on women. a gray one here a little bit ago, and then... Uh, uh, my machine decided to eat it, so oh, that I might have to, that to post up here a little bit later. Gray but. would look good. So yeah, so he mentioned the giveaways for this episode. We're going to be giving away a couple of those patches. Uh, we're going to be giving away one of these um, M18 smoke, uh, whatever you call them, koozie drink drink thingies. <laughs> Thermos. Thermos, thank you. 
to one of you lucky lead heads from Mission First Tactical. We gave away a belly band last episode, and Marco got one too. And uh, James, do we want to give away anything from Factory Forty Seven? Uh, yeah. Let's. Um, do we want to do an well, East it's, German it's, logo? It, yeah, I was gonna say it's the German one, right? We should do like a German tumbler and I don't know shirt. Okay, Does I that dig work? that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe two. You want to do like to the same person or two different people? Let's let's spread the love. All right, spread the love. Let's spread. Let's split it up. Let's let's reward everybody as much as we can, because we got the best listeners here on the Talking Lead AK Corner, and uh, I've got some suggestions for some from some of you listeners also. We're going to read those a little bit later, so don't let me forget that, gentlemen. Uh, but this this episode this this topic, uh, we're going to be talking about the East German AK. And I think from the research that I've been doing on it, it seems to be one of the more solid, um, better produced AK-47s. And it was a licensed think. version. They, they actually got a license from Russia because they were pretty much run by, by Russia. East Germany was. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we should talk a little bit about how East Germany came to be. So after was it World War Two? Um, you you want to jump on that, Marco? Sure. Um, so uh, it's basically, although one would you know think that uh, you know depending on which Allied force actually occupied a particular spot in Germany, and that's how they separated uh, sort of uh, um, areas of responsibility between the Allies. But they have to realize, like, uh, France uh, had a control, a controlled area that never even been uh, in any kind of battle to capture it, right? So it was really um, uh, between the U.S. and the Americans who actually uh, uh, had, uh, had the gains, the territorial gains uh, that they can claim and kind of... Uh, uh, Occupy, and uh, so not necessarily. That's where they kind of came across uh, on the Oder River or whatever, and they shook shook the hands and said, "That's it, the war is over." But uh, that's not the borders. The borders were renegotiated and moved back and forth at the time. You know, with the uh, Berlin being uh, um, also separated in East and West Berlin with access given to it uh, by the by the Russians or Soviets to the Allies so they could go back and forth and uh, right. through the uh, Russian or Soviet held territories. But anyway, the ba- basic thing was this. There's two things in uh, the way the East Germany was created. One of them is the um, anyone who was uh, of any means Right during the Nazis regime, uh, any kind of industrialists, any kind of um, business people, they all left, you know, leaving the regular folk, the, the peasants, the workers, the ones that actually, you know, had very little to do with the Nazi party. They were just worrying about feeding their families and so on and so on. So those kind of like uh, uh, after the Soviets came in and they uh, actually there's a lot of myths about the the Soviet occupation like a million women raped and shit I mean all of that is nonsense um, any kind of uh, rapage if it happened it was punishable by immediate execution oh wow by the order of Zhukov and uh, so Russians try try to as they came in, they had their own martial plan, so to speak. Um, how they're going to run the the occupied territories, and uh, you know they had some volunteers and stuff, and then uh, and uh, people that they kind of <coughs> volunteered <laughs> or mm-hmm. recruited to be the police force, to be the uh, the local government, so to speak. Obviously, with the you know with the overlords watching them and stuff so that's basically how it it all came also another thing another factor that played into the whole thing is what's so-called the reparations and the russia demanded i believe it was like a hundred 
Oh, 10 billion marks in gold. 10 billion? Right. Marks in so gold. So the Allies proposed to give them a... Uh, um, to give them some monetary thing, you know, lump sum pay, uh, payment. And then they said, uh, why don't you take uh, controlling uh, shares, right, in, in all the industries? And uh, to which Stalin said, no, we'll just take it. We'll just so take all did. of it. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, many of the factories, not all of it, but, you know, I mean, they, they took a lot. Yeah, they took a lot, like motorcycle factories and stuff. All of a sudden, the Russia starts producing like a, a what was that motorcycle zoomed up or MZs or something like that copies in Russia. Um, they stripped uh, a lot of the factories down and send the equipment, like the machines and meals and stuff, back to Russia. Even the uh, breweries. <laughs> so they they send the brewing equipment back to uh, Soviet Union and. You know, establish. I can see why a lot of the the business people left <laughs> left East well, Germany. I mean, you you got to realize, you know, it, it, although it sounds to a normal person, a regular person, it sounds like it's a ridiculous thing, right? But you got to realize that the bigger part of the European Russia would lay in ruins. All right, twenty seven million people dead. You know, the cities are destroyed. Uh, St. Petersburg, oh, all these wonderful palaces and stuff, robbed to nothing and burned. Uh, Amber Room, right? It's <laughs> still floating somewhere. Nobody knows where, right? So, uh, priceless, you know, artifacts, a piece of art, all of that has been looted by Germans, right? So, you can see where the Soviets had a, a few questions as to, uh, so I watched we, a, a we, movie. We get back, yeah, know? I don't. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I watched a movie, and I don't know how accurate it is. Uh, I mean, a lot of these movies are uh, glammed up, you know, for the for the big screen. But Monument Men, did you ever, you ever watch that? Of course, of course, and and then you should also follow up by reading an <clears throat> article that just came out. And I forgot which newspaper where the uh, actual one surviving man, uh, the one of the of that team is actually was caught with the, some of the piece of art that he was he actually expropriated. Yeah. Yeah. Here in the U S oh, I don't doubt it. I don't so, doubt they took some of that gold too. You know, if, if that was well, actually yeah, real, I mean, who's been watching, you know, nobody was watching over the shoulders yeah. and you know, I mean, uh, we greedy as a human, so we greedy by nature. Yeah. But was that, so the part where, the mines, you know, they said they were, the Germans, you know, they were looting and stealing artworks and, you know, just, just anything and everything that was of, of value. And they hit them in these mines. Was that was that real? Was that actual? Did they do that? Yes, it was. Yeah, been tunnels and mines. Yep. Yeah. And As then the Russians. Fact, the fam famous Dresden Gallery, which at the time was uh, a rival to uh, Vatican, you know, and uh, even without the uh, the recently acquired by the uh, kind and gentle SS people. But it was already a world-famous um, uh, museum. Mm -hmm. And it happens, uh, it happened almost like the same way as the, in that movie where the Americans actually blew up the, uh, the entrance to a tunnel and then they found all this stuff in there. And it's the same with the Russians. Russians opened up a tunnel they went in and it's like a Caravaggio was just floating. It was all flooded and stuff. It was just floating in the in the sewage and stuff. I mean, it was just a, a ridiculous thing. Yeah, it was. But, uh, but what about the part about the Russians were going, you know, the whole thing about this movie was, you know, Americans being so... Uh, yeah, they're great yeah. and the Russians are evil. You right, know? you know, they're going and they're, get, they're taking this stuff to give it back. You know, to the the original owners, and you know, put it on display in museums, and then they're saying the Russians were coming to take it as. And when you said reparations, that's what made me think of this movie that I and I just watched it last night. I don't know what caused me to watch it, but um, so uh, if you ever land yourself in Saint Petersburg, Russia, okay, and Saint Petersburg is, uh, I would only go if you went with me, Marco. Well, of course, I mean it's my city. I mean, I right? I love that city. You know. 
it's the best city in the world. I can tell you right now, even if the winters suck because it's all kind of wet and cold and windy. But, uh, you know, it still is the most beautiful city in the world. There's nothing compares. Nothing I would love to go. Close. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so you go to, it was obviously the imperial seat, right? Where That's where Tsar was and palaces and all these emperors and stuff. And uh, as a result of it, St. Petersburg wind up with the one of the largest art museums in the world, which is the Hermitage Museum, right? And it's located in, uh, it's actually uh, inside of what they call the Winter Palace. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I have like a personal story that ties me as like all my family and my roots to that, actually, to Winter Palace. Oh, yeah? But anyway... You and, got a little uh, royal blood? Not in the way of... Uh, <laughs> not in the way of... Like, I, I don't... Uh, in any way related to any of the royal family or anything. No, my uh, my great grandfather actually actually served in the Tsar's own light guard uh, signal battalion, and they were famous for uh, during the uh, Decembrist uprising in uh, 1825. Yeah, there you go. They were the first unit that actually came in and occupied that palace to protect the Tsar from the uh, other uh, the officer revolt. And uh, so they got the privilege, and my great-grandfather wound up serving in that battalion in St. Petersburg. But anyway, so apart from that. So, but... I'm telling you, you got to do an autobiography, Marco. I don't know about that. <laughs> but anyway... I'm just a Joe, Joe Schmo with the interesting stories. That's all it is. But anyway, uh, so oh, oh, maybe some people find it interesting and some that. So this is one palace. The summer palaces of each czar or arena or whatever were on the outskirts of St. Pete, right? And uh, it was, um, you know, Catherine the Great's palace, then the Peter the Great's palace, and Paul's palace, and so on and so on. And all those palaces and outskirts, like Google right now, uh, you're showing the Hermitage, but Google right now, Peter Hof, St. Petersburg, Peter Hof, like a German, Peter Hof. H O. Peter Hof, H O F F, in St. Petersburg or something. St. Petersburg. Yeah, St. Petersburg. Uh, let's see, Peterhof. This one? Yeah, Petrov. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that's the one. So, all of those were, um, the Amber Room was in the, <coughs> so, Peter built this palace right here as, as a, to rival of Versailles. It's got like a thousand fa fountains and stuff. It's got all Good kinds Lord. of stuff. It's just his entertainment center. Uh, there were some tricky fountains where people would sit at the gazebo and all of a sudden the water starts coming down on them and whatnot. Look at all this gilded stuff, right? Oh, yeah. It's so, amazing. So all of that's been freaking looted. Oh, it's and not there it's anymore? No, no. So it's rebuilt. It. Oh, okay. But if you look at the Catherine the Great's Palace, and it's been, what, since 1945, it's been almost, what is it, 80 years, right? And it's still only restored to a 60% what it was. Oh, wow. Okay, that's how much it was destruction. And that was and from World is, War this II. Is just a, this is just, a, you know, the, the museums and things like that, right? That place is but huge. Think about the factories, uh, farms, people's houses, the cities themselves, the, all the, you know, all of that's been a lot of... A lot of them has been erased to ground. I mean, completely burned. See that church in the background there? This in the one? upper corner right there? Yeah. If you walk in, what you see is this huge freaking bomb. Like the bomb, like an aircraft bomb that didn't explode. It, it, it went through the roof. But it you know, tells you the divine intervention in a way, right? Oh, yeah. Because the Lord would not let it to explode. And it's still there. It's right there, right at the entrance. They left it there, huh? A nice well, reminder, mean, you right? Know, they dropped it. They dropped it, and they just block has it that uh, it didn't. Oh, well, I'm didn't sure they've off. disarmed it since then, right? Oh yeah, yeah, of course they did. 
Yeah. Yeah, but they left it as a reminder. So you see all these galleries and stuff. That's how long that palace is. Yeah, it's all of that ginormous. Is, is, right, and that was all burned to the ground. There's just uh, maybe wall here, wall there left. And if you go inside of this thing, so there's paintings that there are paintings on the, on the ceiling. Oh, you can see it right there, right? In this that one picture right there in the interior. Look at it. Look at those paintings, man. Oh, good lord! Oh, all of that was destroyed, gone. So now, how do you measure uh, <coughs> the destruction of not just of uh, valuable things, but of your heritage, right? In the way, how uh, do you put a price on it? You can't. I mean, you can't put a price on any uh, any of the you know the lives. Look at all you know the so lives when, that they took. When that mustached. Uh, dictator kind of, you know, <laughs> where old his mustache said, no, we'll take it on our own. Who could possibly blame him? You know what I'm saying? Oh, so, I get anyway, it. I get it. Yeah. So, uh, poor industrialists and uh, business people who made money uh, with Nazis and stuff don't really uh, deserve my sympathy. At all. Comes out East Germany, right? Which is basically a territory uh, that's somewhat industrial. There's some industrial um, areas and stuff, Zul being one. I think the uh, part of the uh, BMW and stuff uh, also there, and, and so on and so on. Anyway, so, and then it's also agricultural and, and whatnot. So, that's what Russia kind of captured, occupied, and then uh, tried to manage it. And uh, um, a lot of it was through uh, so-called re-education, you know, where um, you know, a lot of like a, a labor. I mean, you got to realize anything coming, right, as we know it mm -hmm. today, came from freaking Germany. All of it. Karl Marx, right? Uh, Friedrich Engels, uh, uh, Clara Zetkin, Lenin. Rosa Luxemburg, all of those freaking people who were in the forefront of a, of a union and labor organizers and, uh, I guess, civil rights, you know, movement of suffrage and all that, and the commies all come from Germany. Yeah. Didn't come from Russia, didn't come from America, came from freaking Germany. All the holidays that we celebrate, like a May Day or uh, Women's International Women's Day on March eighth, mm -hmm. all of that is uh, is a ger is very German before the Nazis. So isn't uh, Santa Claus German too? Isn't that <laughs> no? That's Finnish. Is that Finnish? Okay. <laughs> Although in Russia they say that uh, Father Frost uh, lives in. Uh, Far, far north there in the yeah. city. Ustug, Veliki Ustug. Yeah, a great Ustug. So That's let's, let's uh, kind of fast forward to, you know, after the war and then Germany is split into East right. and West. And right. that's where we get East, East Germany. And they're largely, mostly uh, just an outreach of, the, of Russia. Not really. Not really. No. There was none of those countries were like uh, outreach of Russia. I mean, they, all all the countries that were part of the socialist camp, so to speak, were uh, ethnically, culturally diverse, really diverse. You know, like you know, the Romanians couldn't be more more different than the East Germans, for example. Mm -hmm. Bulgarians couldn't be. But wouldn't you wouldn't you agree that Russia had a huge influence over well, absolutely. everything they, they did? Influence. Well, not everything. I mean, think about it though. Like uh, East Pretty much. Germany, <laughs> if Russia produced their own cars, per se, right? So uh, it was Lada, Moscovich, Volga, and all those gas, gas, whatever. Germany never produced anything like this. They produced their own trabants and things like that. In Poland, they produce the Polonaise. Um, in other countries, they well, we're kind of arguing in semantics right now. So, just for the larger picture, Russia had a huge influence on East Germany, 
Correct. Yeah, and I think what happened there was yeah. you had you yeah. had West Germany was basically NATO allies, right? They 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 kind of went ally, and then East Germany stayed with the communist side. So that made them kind of the battleground of the Cold War. Yeah. So you had so NATO, kind of, which West, and then you had Warsaw Pact, which was East. Right, so that made that that put the focus on them, and that's what forced their hand to have like strong military, make all their own, you know, AKs for the sake of our podcast today is that that forced them to do these things. But at the same time, they were coming out of this really nasty conflict with a really bad public opinion, so they had to try to hide this operation while they did it, and that's kind of what started this whole thing. With the with the manufacturing of the the AKs, right? Because they had to they had to build a and and a well equipped military because they were the spotlight of this Cold War mm-hmm. being split with West Germany. But at the same time, public opinion was very anti war in East Germany, so they couldn't just produce you know these massive arsenals of weapon in the public spotlight either. So it became a very delicate balance. Well, so, also uh, worth to mention is the fact that they were completely disarmed at the end of uh, World War II, right? In uh, in 1945, I mean, they were stripped of anything and everything, like their tanks and their artillery and everything else. So they had to rebuild their uh, 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 people's military, right? Uh, and they had to be rearmed, and, and uh, you know, basically, and then. By that time, when, when the, the Russians start to kind of like uh, pull back some of their uh, bases and things like this. And, and I mean, they still have a bunch of them, but the majority of force occupy, occupational uh, or occupying, I guess, uh, force was leaving. So they had to turn those areas of responsibilities to a local military and police. And at that time, that, that happened in the 50s when the Russians were already on their second um, version of their uh, famed rifle, which AKM, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess that brings us to uh, MP, uh, MPI, MPI. right, uh, KM. So uh, that would be the the first uh, rifle that was actually built in the Zul region, near Zul. Zul? Zul, yeah, Z U H L. That's a famous arm, you know, arm manufacturing or firearm manufacturing um, area in Germany. I mean, going back years, you know, to muskets and fusils, right. fusils or whatever you call fusils. And uh, so, um, yeah, that's the first, and that was closely supervised by the Soviet specialists. That's why it came out that good. So, and then, uh, so you take the German manufacturing culture, which usually equates to uh, some sort of elevated quality, and then you, uh, and then close supervision of the Soviets. So, make sure that the, the tolerance is kept and there's no change to design. And that's why, uh, you know, that's how East Germans came out, but came up with the uh, one of the better variants uh, or copies, rather. And would uh, you say it was AK. it was better or the same or by just by proxy, right? Oh no, by um, postulate, I guess. Copy could never be better than the original. But it can come very, very close. So if you had to pick out of Bulgarian, uh, the uh, you know Chinese, for example, Romanian, mm-hmm. or Hungarian guns, you know the East German copy of a Russian a uh, Soviet AKM was probably the best one out of the bunch. That from from all the research that I've done, that's that's kind of what I've gathered is that it was a it was a really well done licensed version of the Soviet 
AKM with just right. slight okay. slight differences here in the furniture mainly being the well I mean I can uh, l- let's do a little um, uh, jeopardy question I guess or, or whatever question okay be question. <laughs> why is that why did they go with plastic stock plastic furniture why did did Germans do that I'm gonna assume that uh, resources that's that's what they had readily available well, because they don't have freaking birches like Russians have. And all of the furniture, all the laminate furniture on the Russian uh, AK rifles, SVD rifle, uh, to a certain extent in the, some of the newer uh, SKSs, were all birch plywood or birch laminate. And uh, so Germany can't really brag about their wonderful uh, birch uh, forests like the Russians can. Right. <clears throat> So they put these little, uh, uh, I don't know what you would call those. What do they call the those? Bumps, nuts, bumps. Yeah. Pebble. Pebble. Pebble stock. The measles. Yeah. They put. They gave their, their stock the measles. Uh, <laughs> um, it's all about the traction and stuff. So. Yeah, I, I assume that's just, you know, because that, that plastic is, you know, gets slippery and, you know, that was to give it some, some grip. Now, the, the grip itself... You know, they, they did a little texturing there on it. The the fore end, they did use wood for the lower part for the hand guard because they found that that plastic would melt. So they did go to the wood um, for the hand guard. And then the gas tube is the, I don't know if that's Bakelite or what kind of plastic. No, no, it's not a Bakelite. It's, it's some kind of plastic. Um I'm not even sure if it's like a glass field or anything like that, but it's just a some uh, heat resistant. Yeah. Do you have plastic. anything about that in your blog, James? Not specifically on the furniture, um, but to go back kind of on the quality a little bit, I did talk about it a little bit in the blog. But in my research, they basically didn't come out the out the shoot swinging with great quality. They had their issues too, just like everybody else. Right. And what they ended up doing was implementing a policy in their factories where workers would be fined or docked pay equivalent to, you know, parts production malfunctions. And so that cleaned up their, their quality pretty quickly. They also uh, implemented their inspection stamp around that time. And so what you started to see was that K3 in the oval and they had other inspection stamps as well. But um, mostly what those signified was that this rifle was fit for service at that time. So it was, they had like a basically a whole tracking system through the factory on not just parts, but also full production. And so when they kind of implemented those changes, their whole manufacturing process uh, quality changed essentially. And from that point on, we started to see the rifles that, are kind of synonymous with today being high quality rifles, but it didn't come out that way in the, in the very beginning. Um, they kind of qu- quickly cleaned that up with those changes. Funny because that particular practice of duck and paint for, uh, uh, not producing, producing the quality of per spec component chain stuff or the whole product is actually the Soviet practice. So yeah. And I, I personally, that, yeah. I personally like I, I love that. I when I was reading that in my research on German AKs, I thought that was just absolutely gold. I couldn't imagine if we implemented some of that in America today where we would be. But uh, anyways, that was something I really admired and I thought was pretty cool about the story of the German AKs. Right. But an interesting thing, if we can, I don't know uh, uh, if we still want to stay in the uh, seven six two gun. Well, but yeah, no let's start. Interest. Yeah, we'll we'll flip here and, and a little kind of do a a natural progression there. So you know, we're still talking about the seven six two right now. Right. Okay. All right. So real quick, I actually just found it here in this in this book. The uh, if you guys are for the AK fans out there, there's a book called The Grim Reaper by Frank Ian Namico. It's pretty expensive. It's out of print, but this book is like absolute gold. And it says right here that the uh, Production increase was 53% when they implemented those changes in their factories in Germany. So you can imagine how, I mean, 53% is pretty big. Yeah, yeah, it's huge. Well, you're, oh, no, I want you to hold that book up. You're talking about that book. Show, show our listeners the book that you're referring to so they can see that. 
the Grim Reaper. There it is, the Grim Reaper. And who's that by? So it's Frank I- uh, Ianomico. Frank Ianomico. Do you know Ianomico? Do you know that guy, Marco? Well, I know of him, and uh, I know mutual friends, but uh, okay, we have mutual friends. But I got you. I got you. So, I mean, just like the 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 Soviet AK, the German AK went through, you know, different stages of maturation. You know, it matured, it, you know, it got better, um, and then, of course, you know, the the five four five comes out. Well, I mean, okay, so when the Soviets went to the AKM model, right? Yeah. Which, by the way, AKM as we know, which is the AK. M M for modernized, modern, modernized, modern, yeah, modernized. Yep. And uh, believe it or not, Type Three, the uh, the milled receiver one, was actually officially named AKM. You know the, but then, you know, somehow, somewhere, that that particular acronym, I guess, or name, drifted away from it, and then. 1959, the stamp version was adopted under that. They readopted uh, it as the, the M. Right. Yeah. And at that time, the Soviets were pretty loose with the licenses and uh, whether they were sold or whether they were bought it for something or was it simply given away. And, uh, of course, by that, by that time, China peeled off a little bit, you know. And uh, uh, which Khrushchev and Mao had the little fallout over the hydrogen bomb, <laughs> so the yeah. Russians would not sell them the new uh, new license to produce the stamped receiver. So the Chinese had to kind of like reverse engineer it themselves, like they do everything. But as, right, go ahead. I'm sorry. I just said like they do everything. Well, Okay, but anyway, <laughs> the Chinese. Uh, and, h- however, the Russians were uh, pretty loosey with their licenses, uh, giving it to their newly established allies under Warsaw Pact, and uh, so hence the Hungarians, um, Romanians, Polish, uh, and East German AKs. And I'm not sure if the Bulgaria was actually uh, producing AKMs. I'm not if somebody would correct me. I know they were doing AK-70 Hanley involved in AK-74s, but um, I'm not sure. But I haven't met like a, or I haven't come across the AKM gun from Bulgaria, from Bulgaria. Like built the kit <clears throat> built gun. So I could be wrong though. I if you do a search on that real quick, Aura. Course. Yeah, I Thanks. So you know the licensing and and at some point, um, Germany had to agree not to commercialize uh, you know their manufacturing of the AKs. It had to be just for them. They had an agreement with with oh, Russia not to export, not right. to export it to to any anyone else, but. Come to find out, they were secretly doing that. And there's all kinds of deals with going on. Like, Pulse was selling selling their lies, uh, their uh, technical packages to uh, Finns. Yeah. And Finns, in turn, were selling it to Israelis. Right, yeah. And uh, so on and so on. So all that stuff was going on. Um, the interesting thing, though, so when... Soviets decided in 1974 adopt the 505 cartridge, right? Um, the partners in uh, in uh, in Warsaw Pact did not. Some of them said, "That's it. We're not buying your license anymore. We're just going to do it on our own." Like uh, so, hence the Romanian, what was it, the Romac three or whatever. Uh, it's uh, basically a 505 chambered uh, um, AKM, uh, which, you know, neither here nor there, it's not really AK-74. AK-74 had the distinct changes in the whole operate, operating system. Uh, 
as far as like the you know the bolt, the bolt carrier, and so on and so on. Right. Um, now, out of exact like checks, they totally went totally different, uh, uh, totally different road. As far as the making their uh, 5.45 gun, and they, by the time uh, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, and you know, and uh, Warsaw Pact kind of <laughs> disappeared, they still only had some functioning uh, uh, prototypes. They didn't really pr- put it in the mass production those guns. However, the two stand out, and one of them is, uh, of course, East German MP. Uh, I-74, is it KM or MK gun, and uh, and then a Bulgarian gun. And in fact, uh, in Bulgaria, the Izmash people came in and actually built and equipped that factory. Yeah, so there's MPI KM was the... That's the AK, it's the AKM, and then there's a the yeah. 74 KM. Yeah, and that one was... Let's see what their designation for that one was. I think it was an MPI. Yeah, it's yeah. MPI KMS 72. Is that it? 72? It could be. The S just refers to the folding stock. So yeah. they had, I believe they had MPI KMS. No, first. here it is. It's, it's, it's also. It's uh, MPI AK 74N is what they called it. Okay. For the 545. And that was actually, again, like uh, Romanians went with their own way, Czechs went their own way, uh, Hungarians, I mean, they went completely off the, you know, chart, so to speak, with their AM, whatever is it, AMD or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, but the only two true AK-74s were one Bulgarian and one East German. And uh, uh, I can't. Obviously, I have a huge experience with the uh, the Bulgarian AK seventy fours of all kinds. But the kit build, or actually purposely build, uh, I have a machine gun now as built in Bulgaria, um, meaning select fire. But um, as far as the uh, seventy four. Is German 74. I held it in my hand for about, I don't know, five, seven minutes the most, but I don't have the practical experience with it. But to me, it looked, I mean, if you would put uh, the Soviet furniture on it, you could never tell it apart. Yeah. Um, Larry Vickers only- has a video on his YouTube channel. He's actually he's actually got a an MPI AKM. It's like an original. It's like a real one from from Germany. Um, it's not made from a parts kit. <clears throat> and then mm. he's and then no, he's, that's pretty, pretty rare. And did they, they never did commercially import those? Did they? No, not into the United States. They didn't. Um, right. But this was at Century Arms had one. He was he got a tour of the Century Arms factory and it was sitting in the back on a crate, you know, in the factory at Century Arms and he 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 saw it. Uh, so I guess it's Century. It's not his. It's Century Arms. Um, but he's got a video where he's he's shooting that. I'll see if I can pull it up while you guys are are talking here. So um, it did have the plastic handguard, probably with the hit shield. Which and one are you showing uh, there, Marco? Is that the seventy four? Uh-huh. Let's see. Oops. Shit. Uh, what did I just do? <laughs> Gosh, desk it. You just showed us your dick pics. Uh-oh. Dick, dick. <laughs> <laughs> Those are not in existence. But, uh, so, um, Very nice. And uh, I'm not sure if it was painted or it was blued. That's the only thing that I am. Um, so they did both on those, and I don't know on the seventy four specifically, but on the on the regular AKs, they started out with painted, and they switched this segment- blue later, or maybe I have that backwards. But they did have both variants um, of finish at some point, and then on that seventy four, I have one of those um, that's cut that hasn't been rebuilt yet, mm-hmm. but 
I've got the stubs and everything and the rivet work on it is just like you say, it's, it's indistinguishable from, you know, you can put it next to a Russian parts kit and examine the rivet work and everything. And it's very obvious. The quality is pretty on par with each other. Like you said, just the furniture is the big difference. Yeah. And, uh, that's what I could, uh, kind of ascertain from, uh, um, holding that gun and going and like contemplating going, should I buy it? Should I buy it? Or should I be like this weird freaking uh, purist and just not buy it? And uh, in retrospect, I should have I should have freaking just uh, made the prudent decision and and bought it. But anyway, it also uh, it also um, kind of marks the entry of that crotch wire folder, the side folder. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's kind of uh, when, and basically, it's essentially the same gun. It's just one of them's got the plastic stock, and the other one's got the um, the crutch folder. You know. Yeah. So the crutch folder is a cool thing to talk about too, because right before they came out with the wire crutch, they came out with the little little Timmy's crutch, <laughs> but they didn't they didn't go into production with it. So it was eventually sold to Egypt. And then we got what, you know, the Mahdi crutch. So it's really unique because, you know, those Mahdi crutch kits came for sale, what, about 10 years ago and were wildly popular, yeah. but it was actually a, a German manufacturer. Most of those Mahdi crutches were actually probably produced by the Germans. They just didn't like their design and switched it for the wire, which they ended up releasing. So I think it's kind of a cool, neat little piece of history. It's one of the things I like about AKs is, um, the foreign countries seem to always do modifications based on some sort of military purpose. Whereas like in America, it's always consumer driven. If, if it clicks and flashes and does some do that thing that John Wick would do, then we want to buy it. But um, so we don't actually do like purposeful driven changes or adaptations, whereas these foreign countries do. And, and I think this crutch is a good example of, Hey, they made a change. They thought it was going to be cool. And then it didn't meet the purpose. So they discarded it and revamped it and then never made it to, you know, where it needed to go until the Egyptians said, okay, well, that's better than what we got, so we'll take it. So it's just kind of a neat part of the story when you talk about German AKs. Funny thing is also uh, kind of like a, you know, if you go back to the 50s and 60s when when the uh, AKMs were being built and uh, or licensed in all these countries and stuff, and then obviously... You can't copy uh, uh, Soviet AKM with its laminate wood and stuff because you don't have the birch trees and things like that. So they had to find their own stuff. Hence the Hungarians with that beautiful blonde stuff that they put on and and so on and so on. Whereas like in the 80s when all the like probably starting 1985 when the Gorby came to power, the 74... Uh, guns were being kind of introduced into uh, on the main stage and at that point that iron grip that uh, the Russian uh, uh, gun design designers industry whatever that had on those factories starting to loosen up and so you know considering the resources that they had in hand and their sort of like a creative control was slowly being passed to the manufacturers in the, in Eastern Europe, then you will see a, a, a large deviations from the, or I guess noticeable, considerable de- deviations from the original designs. And like that wire crutch, it makes to- total, total sense because A, it's something that they designed on their own and uh, they didn't have to redesign, by, they didn't have the two production lines, one with the, let's say, AK-74 and the other ones with the AKS-74 that would have the different uh, receiver, different rear tune in, uh, the stock, the little, uh, the catch up front, and so on and so on. And on the top of it, once the use of uh, optics started to be prevalent in the Warsaw Pact, those crutches folded to the right, not to the left to interfere with the side mount, you know? And so 
that's what I'm kind of like. Uh, my theory is beautifully freaking illustrated is when uh, the say the loosey goosey period of time because when the gore became power, you know, it's like the that iron grip of Soviet grip on all those satellite countries was starting to get really loose at that point. Yeah. <clears throat> so when they they did the you know I mentioned earlier that they you know they negotiated and they couldn't export. Um, that was with the seventy four that they made that agreement. That's how they got the license and to be able to do the uh, the seventy four. And there was none legally um, exported here to the United States, but we did get some parts kits. And I, you know, I think that that's probably where in the United States that the German uh, AK got a kind of a bad reputation because you see some people say they're you know shitty, some people say they're great. It's just the people didn't, they built those part kits and did a shitty job building them. <laughs> I, you know, people that say that they shitty, right, right today would probably kill for like a lesser 10. Oh, of course, you know, <laughs> of course they would. Yeah. Or some, or some like a late bodies and stuff that were like a, with the squished rivets and things like that. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I remember when, you know, early on, Back in like the nineties, everybody was thumping their noses at the uh, at the Chinese guns, or like the, especially stamped stamped guns, especially like the purists, you know. And now, if if one has one like a Type fifty six or whatever uh, S, whatever the uh, gun was called at the time, they will like or Mac ninety, for example. <laughs> I mean, it brings like thousands of dollars if you. If one pops up somewhere in like an auction site. That goes back to what I was saying earlier, though, about like pop culture in the United States. I mean, movies yeah. here drive what people will buy. If John Wick runs a Mac 90, everybody wants a Mac 90, right? Like back in, in when that started, when Mahdi's were coming in and the Chinese guns are coming in, Vietnam War movies were huge. So everyone wanted an AK that looked like Vietnam. When the Chinese guns came in, it didn't pan out because they didn't look like Vietnam guns. So now it's like, everyone would love to have a, a plastic Chinese gun because it's, it's weird. It's different. It's got story. It's got soul. It's a unique adaptation on the AK. And then, you know, you look at stuff today and the big flavor today is, okay, is it black? Does it have rails on it? Does it have something that clicks and flashes? Cool. I want it. Right. And yeah, yeah, yeah. it doesn't have, it doesn't have to have any practical purpose whatsoever, but like you're showing that uh, German AK right now on the, on the screen, that is, you know, anybody who has any interest in AKs, that is a beautiful picture. I mean, that, that should yeah. get you excited, right? And you got some plastic, you got wood, nothing matches. It's just like, it's, that's, that's story. That's soul. That's, that's AK lore right there. Yeah. So this is built, this is built from one of those parts kits that I was talking about, but it, I guarantee it's probably done right. It's Atlantic Firearms has one for sale for, you know, $1,700 right now, which sounds like a pretty good price to me. By but today's can, standards, I'd say that is. But you you also have to like realize uh, a lot of like the purists they want the certain pattern, uh, the the rivets. They oh have yeah, to have a certain diameter. This and this and that. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you right now, and like infantry unit and Soviet Union, especially fighting unit, the ones like uh, the where we were stationed at the 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 separate eight hundred and sixtieth separate regiment uh, you know motorized infantry regiment most of the ak-74s that they had were mixed match like uh, some had like a uh, you know would have a, a purple you know that plum furniture and stuff and then the, and then the, and then laminate stock some would have like a lower handguard that is uh laminate and then the upper handguard is uh is the uh you know, wood and, uh, or the, the plastic, you know, that uh, plum plastic. They were all mixed match. And the reason for that is because it wasn't an essential component. So that when they would bring them in, like, let's say, for repairs, often like uh, prolonged gunfights and stuff, guns do get hit. They do get, uh, uh, you know, they break. And they bring them to armor. The armor couldn't care less what kind of pistol grip you had, what kind of lower handguard you had, whatever was in that bin. And the first thing he grabbed, he would put in that gun. However, all the serialized parts, you know, like the bolt carrier, the bolt, and 
top cover. All of those things were uh, were still stayed within that gun, unless they had to be replaced due to damage or something. So yeah, and uh, so the people would often ask me, "It's like, what was your gun? What was that? Like, uh, what was you know?" And at the time, I was like, "All I could tell you was a serial number, because that's what they drilled into us, you know. Because God forbid you lose it." And that was uh, your ass. You know, but other than that, it's <laughs> like, uh, yeah. Other than that. You know, and I, I think that's probably the same in any of the the military countries that that you know uh, operate with those with that platform because at the end of the day, I mean, those couple components you just named, like the barrel and the bolt and and whatnot, those are all interfaced to each other. But outside of that, like you said, functionally, none of the other stuff matters. And so you see a lot of that in, I mean, you see those pictures like in Africa and different places. They got all kinds of weird stuff on. I mean, whatever works, right? It, it's yeah. just to keep your hand from get baking to the barrel, you know. Right. But you know, in our case, we obviously we could not make any modifications, and all these people saying, "Oh, you know, when you were a sniper, you would probably mark the little marks every time you have a hit." No, God forbid, I did something like this. I mean, I would be freaking. Uh, you know, I would be pulling the KPs, which were not part of our upbringing where I serve, but I would be, I don't know, I would be doing some freaking weird jobs and probably never go on another raid. So you could not modify, write anything in your, giving your gun a name per se, and then carving it in the stock or anything like that. So uh, the only person who could modify your gun would be the armorer on the battalion level. And uh, um, so all the you know, but then if you're non-regular, you know, like those Mujahideen or whatever, they use all kinds of shit. Yeah. So and the AK-74, East Germany, um, <clears throat> started production, was in 1983. And it was 1990 is when, I guess, the end of the, you know, the unification of Germany happened. It was in 1990. So... They only had a short, you know, few years to start producing the the AK seventy fours, and um, you know, like I said, they were they were secretly exporting some of these to to some other countries, which they weren't supposed to do. And See, I think you can't talk about the German AK without talking about the exports and secrecy, because yeah. the black market on on AKs globally, it, it's often thought and said that Germany was the biggest black market exporter in the, on the planet of AKs during that entire period. Right. So we don't know how so many were actually kind of produced. Huge. So they theorize around 4 million, which is about a hundred thousand annually or 274 rifles a day. So you can imagine these two factories were cranking these things. If you've ever built an AK, you can imagine how big this operation yeah. probably was. That was the AKMs, um, right? Yeah, I believe so. I don't know if that, you know, I'm, you, you caught me off guard there. I don't yeah. know if those numbers include the 74 or not, but okay. it's that's still an awfully high number. The way I understood uh, it was the AKMs uh, as far as well, that number goes, but it could have been the 74s were included in that. I don't know. I, I probably will agree with you uh, based on, um, you know, looking at the, some of the countries, like let's say in the Middle East and stuff, they, they would have uh, that's a good point. production of 7.62 by 39 ammo. And uh, the 505 ammunition was kind of almost like a exclusive thing to uh, to the Soviet Union, maybe to some point in Bulgaria or whatever. But um, yeah, I would I would assume it would be AKMs and 762 guns, yeah. like the yeah. PLO, Yemen, Algeria, India, Iran, Iraq, yeah. Congo, Egypt, yeah. Afghanistan. Yeah. And it's interesting that you mentioned the time frame when it was happening. And uh, by 1990, or even 1989, like I would even go as far as saying like 1987, the smart politicians in all, the, all around the world already saw writing on the wall mm -hmm. that the Soviet Union was going broke. It's not going to, uh, you know, it'll be interesting if it remains as a country as whole and which it didn't and of course all those um handouts were dwindling 
and will come to a, a screeching halt uh, to all those satellite countries. So they had to kind of fend off for themselves and uh, screw the licensing agreements. Right. We're just going to go ahead and sell as many as we can. So this way we can, uh, you know, uh, put money in the budget. And uh, so, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised, but that's that's pretty much the timeline. So the the last AK pattern rifle made in East Germany was the STG 940. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. STG. Yeah. The they brought up a good, a good five five angle. six cartridge. Or oh. <laughs> I guess I just threw up a little bit there. <clears throat> so it was pretty. There was a question, and somebody asked. That. I threw up a lot of it. A lot of it. <laughs> Neto. You know, because they're, they're, as soon as the Berlin Wall, Wall came down and the Soviet Union ceased to exist, all of those little countries wanted to join NATO under auspices, like saying, well, if we join NATO, then immediately every one of us will drive a freaking Mercedes and every one of us will have a summer house somewhere in the uh, 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 Riviera, French Riviera and stuff, and we all will retire all happily on the 10,000 uh, whatever euros a month um which of course it wasn't you know nothing close to the reality of the truth yeah but nevertheless it was amazing how fast they joined nato right yeah all of them so this and, was uh, oh go ahead yeah so the czechs the germans um poles even the bulgarians came up with the ak based design in five five six yeah and i guess none this... of them really panned out other than barrel which is the polish gun well but this was kind of their way to get they around could... that um that negotiations that they that they had with russia on the ak-74 is they came out with the stg 940 with the five five six cartridge and then that's you know where it opened up where they could start you know importing to to India and Peru and, you know, some other countries. But then as they started getting into that, that's when the unification happened of Germany. And when that happened, they shut all, all these, all this manufacturing in East Germany down and it just came to an end. Yeah. So, uh, why have a, uh, why have uh, a competitor? Right. So when that uh, when that shut down, when the reunification happened and their factories shut down, from the research I read, there was uh, basically like overnight these factories didn't exist. And you got to remember they operated in secret, like up to this point and through most of it, they were they were masquerading as like a toy companies and things like that, making Christmas toys. Yeah. So <laughs> oh, that was good. Because cool. this was this was all about public opinion, right? You didn't want your country to know, you know, this this country that's masquerading as a peaceful nation now to know that you're actually secretly making massive amounts of arms and black market exporting them around the world. So when this just ceased to exist, all these people got repurposed into different jobs and the factories just stopped. They didn't have a plan on what to do with all these weapons and parts. So the black market on that stuff exploded overnight and millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of arms just sort of went missing over about a six month period after the reunification. And there was no government plan on what to do with it. So this stuff filtered out into the streets of Germany. It filtered out into neighboring nations, and it just kind of became a huge mess, for, for lack of a better word, way of describing it. So, anyways, talking about East Germany and the black market and secrecy, it's it's very interesting. You kind of almost can't cover the MPI without talking about the the secrecy of the Christmas toys operation, and and that's the other part of it too is that they had they had to have these special level of employees right because they're operating in secret so this wasn't just any regular employee these were skilled laborers that had to pass some sort of clearance process so there were high paid people that were making these rifles too so that goes back to that quality we were talking about earlier so let's talk about this um if how can someone know that they've got a german ak uh, james the markings that they need to be looking for so, I mean, the first obvious one would be to look on the Trunnion for the K3 and the oval stamp. And a lot of the kits that came in and got uh, rebuilt were 
kind of scrubbed, so it might be fairly faint on the trunnion. I've noticed on the 74s, it tends to be a lot more bold than on the uh, uh, 762 variations, but that's the first thing I would look at. It's usually right around the barrel pin. So this is the, the markings, the oval K3. I've got your website pulled up, James, with your... It and Perfect, another, yeah. another thing to look for is the uh, night sights and the front sights. The night sights and the front sights? Yeah, and the front sight, the front port, uh, there's a flippable night sight. Okay, and that's that's specific to the East German AK? Correct. Good, good tip. What else is there? Is there anything else? And, and I know that they had markings... In more than one place. So they had other proof marks for like inspection stamps. They like a lot of proof marks. A, a lot more prevalent on their uh, milled guns, which isn't something you probably encounter uh, in our country. But um, those are also uh, on the website. Actually, I have them, I think, on a flag. But uh, the serial numbers, I believe they start with a two-digit uh, year. And, and who knows how they marketed their black market or how they marked their black market uh, <laughs> rifles. I, I honestly, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I, I assume they're the same because where you see a lot of them is in like places like Africa and South America, Central America type. Uh huh. And they, and they appear to be the same. They appear to be the same. That's not very smart on their part. <laughs> So the rear sight, oh no, that's not it. Hold on. I think the rear sight marking is different too. Okay, while you're looking that up, let's uh, let's go to our listener questions now. I think this will probably uh, wrap up any loose ends that maybe we missed. Um, of course, here's here's one from your buddy, Aura. And, and Aura, I said his name was Nikolai uh, <laughs> earlier. I can't help but call you Aura because that's, that's how I know you. It's all good. Uh, your good buddy P-Man. Were the East German AKs chambered in 5.56? This one's for Nikolai benefit. And of course, we know you hate the 5.56. So. That was a fact. Uh, good, old, good old Pierce busting your chops. Uh, oh, he, he, he's been waiting on that. Man. Oh, yeah. I, he'd be mad <laughs> if I didn't read it, so I had to read it. Rear sight mark is an N. Go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. What, you got a picture of it? Can you hold it up? I don't. I have a picture of it. I do not have a picture of it handy. I apologize. Uh, let's second. see. Brett Bedal. Were the basic AKM type? Were these basic AKM type, or did they make any modifications to the basic design? Uh, I think we kind of covered that, didn't we? Already. That one Ranger 04, what happened to the East German after East Germany went bye-bye? Uh, is he asking about the people or? Uh, not uh, sure. If he's talking, I mean, if he's asking about the factories, it's like we kind of covered. They just ceased to uh, exist essentially overnight. Yeah, and they then... shut them down, basically, that we, that we know of. I mean, again, they could have kept them operating in secret. Who knows? Um. But as far as the people, they just all became Germans again. They were Germans. They were just living in different places. They had East and West, and they had different political ideologies, and one was NATO, and one was Warsaw Pact. And I guess some like people, California and the United States. I guess some people may have moved to Russia. I mean, I don't know. I don't nobody know. moved. To nobody Russia. moved to Russia. <laughs> Nobody's no. going to Russia. No. I mean, unless there are like mixed marriages or something. Yeah. But uh, majority, I mean, stayed and got integrated into uh, one great German nation. And uh, obviously it took years uh, to um, integrate because, uh, you know, the, the way that the, the social structure in two different Germanys were drastically different. Whereas, like, let's say the, the apartments were given out for free if you work, you know, at the factories or whatever. And in Eastern Germany, where you had to mortgage and buy uh, your uh, houses and apartments in West Germany. And, um, 
you know, things like that. Uh, of course, a lot of people relocated as soon as they were able to leave East Germany to go to West to seek a fame and fortune. Um, some of them came back and it took years for uh, East Germany fully integrate into the... But that's uh, why they put that Berlin Wall up is so that people wouldn't leave. East Germany, they put landmines up and... It was, yeah, I, I don't know, you know, not familiar with the, the reasoning behind it. It's, but I think it was, you know, because it didn't, the wall did not just go across the entire freaking span of Germany. It was just in Berlin. Yeah. And the reason for that is because, you know, allies wanted the part of the Berlin, you know, like as occupying, occupying force. So... Uh, before they could, you know, how do you separate? How do you separate the so-called uh, capitalist society versus the socialist society and not intermingle? So they had to build a wall. So the corporate in building the wall wasn't just the Soviet Union. It was both, right? Because uh, the Allies did not want any, any kind of commie uh, ideology coming across. Mm -hmm. Neither did the Soviets uh, wanted any kind of uh, capitalist ideology coming across, so the, it, they built a wall. And it was only in Berlin. It wasn't uh, all the way. I mean, there was a regular border, I'm sure, barbed wire and all that stuff in the in the uh, in the countryside, you know. But it wasn't uh, all the way across. It was just in Berlin, hence the Berlin Wall. Flood Munitions yeah. asks, what is the reasoning behind choosing the AK platform over the roller-delayed weapons that most of Germany is known for? And I think we answered that. Is... Because it doesn't freaking work, that's why. <laughs> well, they were influenced by Russia. No, I mean, uh, I'm talking about the roller stuff. I mean, it's great police guns, but you, you put it in the trench and stuff somewhere in the dirt and the mud. I mean, just look, look at the pictures from Ukraine. That's your modern war right there. I mean, there's a cake cake of mud on your gun every time, twice a year. You know, and uh, and then, uh, then there's a winter. And uh, so that's why they didn't uh, do the roller stuff. But... I mean, Western uh, part of Germany actually did a decent job with producing those G3s and G36s and stuff like that. Yeah. FPS Murdoch, why did the East German wire folding stock fold to the right? Wouldn't that make the rifle difficult to fire unfolded, i.e. running the safety? Second question, I've heard East German AKs are awesome and I've heard they are junk. What say you? So we kind of answered that second one already. Yeah, the reason it pulls to the right is just so it doesn't affect the uh, side mount uh, for your optic. And it's because it's a wire, it doesn't, uh, the actual stock part goes past your charging handle. So, and the wire is the wire, so it doesn't interfere doesn't affect. with the safety or, or the uh, charging handle. So you can fire it with the stock folded. But let me uh, mention something from my experience. Yes, sir. Okay. And I have 27 jumps so with the parachute. So uh, the reason for folding stock on the AK right, is so there's no broken jaws and missing teeth when you hit the ground, when you parachute. And uh, the Soviets don't use the drop bag like the U.S. does. They use, they stick the gun in their straps, right on their chest. And they have this little piece of rope that you tie it to, uh, to a gun to secure it so it doesn't drop out of that rigging. And if you have a full stock, then it's obviously would be right where your chin is. And when you hit the ground, that stock will go and uh, pretty much uh, shatter your lower jaw, and upper jaw, and lose all your be teeth. Missing the teeth. So the folding stock, purpose of a folding stock in the AK was simply for parachute jumps, not for some kind of Rambo firing from the hip or uh, anything like that. So if the gun doesn't shoot when it's uh, folded, it's not a, not a big deal. Unfold the stock and it'll shoot. Very good. So PPRN and Mustang Perry have very similar questions here. 
Basically, is there anything the East Germans did to the AK that that improved it, or you know, any any marked differences from the Russian? I don't think we've really heard anything other than the crutch. <laughs> I don't think there's anything that necessarily improved it. Like, yeah, you mentioned the crutch. That was their uh, attempt at making or improving the folding concept, but then they scrapped it in favor of the wire. So they never actually produced that and went with it. It was just a testing and evaluation thing. The only reason we even know about it is because they sold it off to the Egyptians. Um, but then the other marked difference is really the furniture. And like Marco had said, um, they had access to the beech wood, but it certainly wasn't uh, something they wanted to use for everything, but probably cost related or supply chain related. So they went with the polymer for as much as they could and only used the beech wood for the uh, gas tube cover. So, it's not necessarily an improvement. It's just was done on necessity. They use it for the handguard. And, and the night sight. Or, yeah, handguard, sorry. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the night sight. Pacific Northwesterner. Uh, man, I'm looking forward to this episode. East Germany is super interesting. Two questions. First, why did EG make milled type 3 AKs and about how many were made? Second question, when the Berlin Wall came down and Germany was reunified, where did all their AKs go? Thanks. <laughs> So they they either sold them off or they destroyed them. No, so that second question, Ed, kind of already touched on that. It they just black market disappeared over about a six month period. Yeah. Um, but they but, destroyed a lot of them too. Yeah, I would imagine a lot of them just kind of filtered into the populace. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine if our military arms factory or whoever right just stopped today and disbanded. And left a building full of weapons. Uh, you know, would we go in and destroy them? Uh, I mean, for public, uh, public, <laughs> for public well, uh, optics, they probably would. You know, have a few that they would say, "Yeah, we destroyed them all." But you know, secretly. Okay, let, let's say yeah. our arms factory was a toy factory for Christmas, but only like a select group of us knew what was really going on. And tonight, it stopped and didn't exist. Oh, anymore. we had keys to the building. What happens to the guns? I've got several truckloads full, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but, I mean, I saw some terrifying pictures I still cannot unsee. And uh, that's when Latvia, which is a NATO country, did away with their Makarov pistols. Mm. They literally melted them down. Oh. oh. It was tubs, you know, one of those, like, uh, dumpsters uh, full of brand new freaking unissued Makarovs. So I cried for weeks, I'm thinking, and was shivering uh, in the corner with despair when I saw <laughs> that. But, uh, yeah, they do that. That was well okay. justified. That was a well justified tear that you shed there. Let's see. J. Edgar Paradox at Factory 47. Where do we find the identification markings? What are they? And we just talked about that. Uh, what are we looking for? So we answered that, J. Edgar. You find so, you know, one thing on that, though. Uh, is a lot of times at gun shows and, uh, and trade shows and stuff, you'll stumble on AKs that people will build or whatever, or they'll just get like a Wasser or something like that, and they'll put German furniture on it. German furniture is very prevalent uh, floating around the industry. So a lot of times you can get kind of caught off guard because they'll make it look like it's an East German. And you, if you're not paying attention to that Trunnion mark and the serial number, you absolutely could end up buying yourself a – lower end Romanian or something or a kit build from somebody that's not East German parts, but has East German furniture and was sold as an East German for probably an East German price. So it is something to note and to keep an eye on if you are uh, in the market and checking gun shows. Oh, uh, let's see. Jerry Black, he's not asked a question in a while. Uh, we, we answered it. Germany says they made so many AKs just leading up to the wall coming down. Where did all the AKs end? Uh, follow up to your knowledge. Are they still in use today? Is anybody still using the, the East German? There's a lot of people in Africa using them. Let's see. J. Edgar Paradox again. Off subject, I am wanting to build an AK-74. Any insight on the new W-Y-T-W-O-R-N-I-A Brony uh, Jack Popinski WPB parts kits that Arms of America have. Get it or stay away. I'm not familiar with that. You guys familiar with the WBP parts? I'm kits? not super familiar. I do know that the stuff coming in a couple years ago, WBP, like the Virgin uh, AKM kits, were pretty solid quality. Um, 
but that's about all I know. Ryan Reisner at Talking Lead. Generally, I haven't heard much about East German AKs other than they're good. Is that because they're uh, they are in much shorter supply than other big Comblock countries AKs? What makes them good? It's just the rarity, and I mean they were they were well made. Uh, you know, we just talked about earlier. They were well supervised by the Russians, you know, and schooled on how to make them. And as Marco said, they were probably one of the better made licensed AKs. Uh, but they're very sought after because they're rare in America. B. Hirsch, can you refresh on how East Germany got the tooling and was it approved or stolen? We did, we covered that. They they were licensed. ESOM 87, I just saw the 9-3 Tactical AK Corner Patches. Those are amazing, and I've got to have one to represent my favorite podcast. So, Nikolai, Aura, how can people get these patches? Well, right now, the only way you can get the patch is, or this specific patch, is by uh, listening and uh, taking part in the Participate, the listen, and win to the AK Corner? Yeah, so uh, I think out of, out of the couple that I'm giving away, we'll uh, we'll give him one for sure. Okay. Uh, just message me and let me know. Uh, you can find me on Instagram and uh, let me know whether you want the uh, the black or the tan, and we'll we'll pop that one in the mail for you. So there you go, Asum eighty seven. Um, you win one of those patches. Uh, email me talking at gmail dot com. Let me know what you won, and I'll forward it on to. To uh, Nikolai, I want to call you Aura. Uh, either way, Shep Gun. Well, let's... Yep, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask Nikolai how he would prefer to be called. Oh, it, it matters not. I'm uh, calling him Aura because that's <laughs> that's what I call him. I'm not going to say your last name because it's just Abplanap. Is that right? Abplanap. Yeah. Abplanap. Not uh, not too terrible. Many of us running around. So. How did you come up with nine three tactical? So, uh, you know, all the guys I talked to that've been in the military and everything. You know, they uh, you end up fighting in the trenches for the guy to your left and to your right, right? So the nine and the three, the left and the right, and the clock, just like you know, you look twelve o'clock, three o'clock, nine o'clock. Interesting. I so, like that. It's uh, it's about the camaraderie for you know the guy. Okay, that's me. that's super cool. Honestly, I didn't. Yeah, uh, that is good. That is that's good. badass. Good. You get mad props for that one. Ah, thanks. <laughs> I dig it. Uh, Shep Guns. Where did K three rank in the makers of AKs? What weapons were made? I don't rank as far as like quality, desirability. I guess I don't like know numbers. I mean, I like as far as like ones I want or would want in my collection. I, I rank it towards the top yeah i mean I, I, i'd say i have them up there they're just for their overall quality you know you gotta you know you could pick one up as long as it wasn't you know american kit built it depends on who built it but you could pick one up and you got a fighting gun in your hand so you got to put it at the top of the list or towards the top for that right there yeah and uh, of course collectability you know because they just not too many of them around i think it'd be top three at least oh absolutely um, here's another Esom. Damn, Esom's got a bunch. Uh, let's see. Were East German rifles licensed from the, yeah, we talked about that. Uh, what AK is commonly available in the U.S. now that you would consider the one to have? Can't pick the Occam because Brian doesn't have them available at the moment. And, and I have, I talked to Brian today and, you know, he's doing good. He's just really busy. And uh, we're going to get him on when when, you know, when things settle down a little bit. Uh, but uh, I had a lot of you ask me about where Brian is, and Brian is you know still plugging away, working hard, and um, feeding his family. So there you go. So what AK is commonly available in the U.S. Uh, now that you would consider the one to have? So I guess he's talking about American-made AKs. Well, I mean, can I take that? Yeah, absolutely. We're all going to take it. I'll let you go first. All right. The best AK rifles now available, that is uh, the ones I sell. No, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> Those aren't made in the U.S. Those are imported. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, no, probably KUSA would be the... Uh, a better rifle to have rather than, let's say, kit bill, 
unless it's like a gym builds it or somebody um, really reputable. Um, like a, what about an Arsenal it. or a um, the the guys in Vegas um, rifle dynamics? That's Ar- Arsenal, and then there's the people in Boca Raton, which is uh, the Kalashnikov USA. So the thing with Arsenal is, for some reason, they were sitting on the freaking gold pile. Right, and they decide to kind of shit all over it, and then come up with the mutant. And uh, a lot of people say like Sam Seven or whatever that freaking thing is. is the like mutant, got the, isn't that CMMG? Uh, something like that. It's got the um, build receiver, but then it's got like a, a seventy-four block uh, gas block and stuff. I mean, I guess it's a functional gun and everything. I mean, if you were gonna we were going to go with the AK rifle, per se. Why would you want two more pounds of weight, per se, right? So yeah. you yeah. probably want to go with the modern design, which was modern in 1959 and kind of remains uh, with the stamp receiver and stuff. I mean, if it was, if the milled receiver was it, then the, the countries like Russia, per se, or even China would remain true to that receiver and then they'll keep it but um so from collectability point of view it's neither here or there i mean it's it's a thing that's merged out of it's like sort of like frankenstein however it is very functioning gun uh is it worth paying that much for that particular gun i don't know if unless you have unless you have every variant already that you wanted in your collection and you just wanted a good solid shooter and you're willing to pay with it what they bring in then yeah of course yeah so you're saying the kusa is the one you would go to right now absolutely it's the closest thing it's done uh to the 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 original one produced at the mothership and um you know with the same uh technical package the drawings and everything else not without a foul, of course. Uh, like, for example, we've got three over here. Uh, my son got one. And uh, they um, put the uh, back, uh, the rear side block, uh, too much for as uh, all kinds of gaps in it. And the, and the top cover didn't fit on it. You, you start firing and that thing flies off. And took them a while. So we had to send it back. and But they, they you know, they stepped up and, and fixed it. And send it back. How long ago so, was this? That's probably like a year and a half ago. Maybe. Oh, okay. Because I sent so, one back but, and never got it back like over five years ago. <laughs> no. Yeah. Really? Yep. Five years ago. It's well, been it's been work? longer than five. I don't know, maybe maybe it's six or seven years ago, but it's when they first came out with them. With I got the one. Threes? Uh yeah, it was their first the seven six two by three nine that they came out with. I got one of the very well, first ones. They've gone a long way since. Yeah. And uh, the ones that... I wouldn't know because they never sent mine back, so I don't have anything to do with them anymore. But <laughs> but did they did they refund it? No. No. Didn't, didn't get really? any. No. I mean, how is that possible? I, you tell me. <laughs> it, it happened, though. Uh, I've still got, I've got the serial number. I've got the... I've still got the box. Well, have you tried to contact him? I I contacted him several times, yeah, many many times until I was just like, all right, forget it, it ain't worth it, screw him. Anyway, let's move on. Um, and then James, what about yours? Thing. What's your go-to? Well, Me? On, I'm not done yet. Oh, I'm you're not done yet. yet. Okay. <laughs> so if you want, if you only have a little bit of money, let's say about eight hundred dollars or something. Mm-hmm. Then probably the best bet would be to spend it on buying like Pioneer Arms Polish gun. And the reason for that is not because like I'm somehow affiliated with it, but because that factory that that uh, I've Circle been there by the o- way. It's oh it's, you have been, it's impressive. Right? Yeah, I've I've done a tour of their factory. Well, they've been building this gun since 60, 60s. Okay, so if there's a a factory that has an expertise in building the basic AKM rifle, that would be that factory. Out of the ones that, you know, already moved on and 
building something different. Yeah. So if you have somebody, and I'm not going to drop any names or anything. Not name dropping. Here, uh, the, uh, you know, building AKMs on their, on the, whatever the receivers that they, maybe their own or no duck spot or something like that. <laughs> and, uh, and they're building the AKs here. You've got to realize their expertise span is like, what, four or five years, maybe the most. Uh, and maybe I'm talking a about the mass production. I'm talking about mass yeah, production. Yeah, century. I'm, They've been making them for a while. Yeah, but again, they went with the mutant. Uh, century? Wait, yeah. Their first RSA rifles. They even had the side mount style. Those were Yeah, those were horrible. But, I mean, they've since honed and improved. And, you know, same thing with PSA. Same, well, like I said, I'm not going to drop any names. But I'm saying, yeah. so my top guns would be KUSA, Polish uh, Pioneer Arms, then Arsenal. Those three that I would... Uh, no rifle dynamics? No. No? None at all? Oh, okay. Well, it's a kid-built guns, right? I think most of theirs are, yeah. I mean, good guns, they produce them, but it's like... Or they've a, got somebody it, doing the receivers it's not, it's, not like a, it's not like a production line that would actually build them. Yeah, I don't like, know how they do you, it. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I mean, I, I'm happy with the rifle dynamics. The, the product is really good. So what's the name, um, of you, name of your company again, Marco? Oh, mine? Yeah. Aptech. Spell it. Applied Technologies. Okay. APP. And you're, that's who's importing the the Polish. Distributing. Distributing. Does that have a cool story, like having a comrade on your right and your left and supporting each other or anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. Oh, oh darn. Nikolai's got that one. He's got okay. that one sewed up. Um <laughs> It, it, it feels like every time I turn around, there's like five daggers in my back. You know. <laughs> I think so, you should. I think you should send me one of your distributed Polish uh, rifles, Marco. Well, you know who you gotta call, right? <laughs> call you. <laughs> call you. You're the man. <laughs> you hold all the rights. All right, James. What? Question to you, <laughs> AK. Man, I mean, this is, I don't even know if I can answer this American made AKs. Yeah, so I, like, I've become such an AK snob over the last eight, ten years that, like, I don't even pay attention to American made AKs anymore. I, I'm not, like, I'm so distant from it that I don't really know what's going on. You're just on more into the collect collectability and getting the rare, unique. Yeah, well, I, I went down that road and then, you know, and I collected kits, so I build my own off, off of kits. So as far as production line, I really, I don't have a fair, a, a fair assessment. Like if I named one or another, I, I wouldn't be, it wouldn't be fair. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I'll go with, I'll go with Marco on this one. Nine See, three. He, on he, he is the tr one who's truly responsible. <laughs> 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 Nikolai. Uh, you know, as far as production guns go, man, I uh, I kind of fell in love with the KUSA 103. Um, it's a solid rifle. We played with them a lot at Clash Bash. And, uh, and then, I mean, production guns, that, that's where I would go in the U.S., but... Uh, and then kit built, you know, you'd go with have to go with Fuller or uh, Buddy Billy Cho over there at Ironborn or you yeah. know, somewhere along that. Of course, Occam, but I'm kind of partial to that, you know. Well, he said it, he said we can't pick Occam. Oh well, because that's who we would pick. I would pick Occam. I mean, that's the only one I own, so you know, over so there somewhere. All right, next question. Let's move on. What ammo do you use? Tongue for twisting. Um, that's his question. What ammo do you use? I use all of it. I use all of them. <laughs> I use whatever I get. Yeah. I just put it in there and it shoots. Defiant Munitions makes a, a really good high quality brass 7.62 by 3.9. You want to go that way. Um, but, you know, it's an AK, so it'll eat anything pretty much. B. Hurst has asked just lots and lots and lots of questions here so you win for the most questions asked be hearst uh, and i think we've covered most of them uh, other than bayonets do you does anybody know anything about the bayonets that were used <laughs> try me 
<laughs> okay, let's try you. Uh, why the difference in bayonets, he asked. Uh, like a progression from uh, the Type 3 into uh, Type... Well, I think you know, just the ones that the East the Germans used versus, I guess, the ones the Russians used. It was all, everyone uh, from Romanians to Germans to, you know, whoever produced bayonets were copies of a Russian bayonet, or Soviet bayonet. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the the bayonet progression was from a, just a pig sticker. Uh, now, you know, bayonet, I uh, guess, development was spurred by World War Two, right? But the Russians came in with the pig sticker, which is like a, what is a triangle, uh, I think it's a rectangular to uh, ground it to uh, just a, uh, like a screwdriver type tip on their Moss and Magans. However, at the same time, uh, Tokarev rifles were issued with what they call a bayonet knife, right? And the earlier version had the blade up. And the reason for that, and the later one, blade down, which doesn't make any sense. Blade up, meaning you stick it and then you pull towards you, you know, and obviously the, the sharp edge would cut through the whatever you're sticking, sticking it with. Anyway, then, um, so we go to AK bayonet, which was, you can't call it a knife. It was just a, a flat bladed a pig sticker, right? So you can't even open your C ration if you uh, wanted it. And then the, so the Russians told that, oh, we can do two in one and make a bayonet knife, right? So they came out with that uh, Bakelite rounded handle and then uh, and then uh, um, a steel scabbard with the rubberized handle on it to accommodate cutting the wire and not be, being shot, you know, electrocuted. And uh, so that was the first variant. And uh, when they were selling those licenses to the the friendly countries, that was the one that was first produced by all those uh, satellites. Then the next uh, development of that particular bayonet was uh, with... Uh, squared off handle uh, handle and the reason for that is because they could use it as a hammer once you put the ring that goes around uh, the muzzle you stick it into the scabbard and then you got your hammer and then you can actually use it as a hammer and uh and then they got the scabbard now was completely encased in uh bakelite so some of the countries adopted the handle of this type three, I guess, bayonet, and but still remain and still kept the steel scabbard with the uh, the rubberized uh, or handle on it, or I guess sleeve. And then uh, the I guess the last Soviet form of bayonet came in the, with the uh, AK seventy four. All the early uh, AK seventy fours that were dressed in the uh, in wood and laminate wood had that type three bayonet that uh, the uh, um, and mind you it was called bayonet knife so they expected you to fight with it as, as a fighting knife but you could never ever sharpen it it was uh, frowned upon and punishable so you couldn't cut anything with that knife i mean you could probably cut butter with it that's about it. Spread butter, but, with uh, it. but you could stick somebody and uh, you know and hurt them really bad with it if you knew how. So, and the final version of it was once they start kind of maybe after Vietnam War, which capturing some of those uh, M16 rifles with their what is it M is it M7 bayonet was uh, M9. No, M9 is the big one. The, big the, one? the later version, but what was it? M7? Whatever. That, the one that was issued with M16 that had kind of like a double uh, sided uh, uh, sharp blade at yeah. the tip, right? Yeah, the M7. Right. So they went A, they developed the sub caliber, right? 
and then they uh, decided that they're going to go with that type of blade, double uh, double edged blade. And then they came, you know, they came out with the later AK seventy four. For the lack of a better term, it would be a, a Type four bayonet, which was useless, to put it politely. Which I mean, it would work fine as a bayonet. Uh, questionably as a fighting knife and uh, but it kind of looked cool and then it lost a bunch of its a uh, uh, um, bunch of its features such as being the hammer being the pick and so on and so on so I don't know what they were thinking about and since then uh, w- with the uh, adoption of AK-12 they actually came up with a pretty decent um, uh, bayonet slash knife, which the snob that I am, I'm here to tell you I have one. <laughs> You've got and, one? Yeah. Uh, you want to see it? Well, yeah, absolutely. All right. All right. All right. I'll do of it. Of course oh, we want to see it. <laughs> That's why we record this thing with the video. So, as he's grabbing that, I'm going to quit sharing my screen here. I was showing some bayonets. Uh, we've got a email from one of our listeners, and I can find my email. So, this is from Bailey Mueller. Muller says, Hi, Lefty. I hope you had a nice Easter. In the past few episodes, you've asked for a few suggestions for the AK Corner. And I've been thinking about potential topics you could do. And as Marco's back now, so you got the... That's the AK-12 bayonet. The AK-12 so, bayonet, okay. So this is uh, actually a uh, uh, good fighting and utility knife. I don't know if you can see it or not. Pull it back closer to you. What's that? I was just, yeah, and then move your head up or your bill or your cat. There you go, that light. Perfect. And it's actually sharp. You can actually cut stuff with it. It's got the uh, glass buster yeah. right there. Oh, and the, if you notice, there's no more hole in the blade of it to marry it with the uh, scabbard to make it the wire cutter. Yeah. The wire cutter now comes on the scabbard. Nice. Like so, and on the top of it, this is just a part of the gun that it's being. So there's a diamond plate to sharpen it. Mm-hmm. This is uh, just a part of the like, knife. Actually, comes with numerous ways to suspend it. Uh, you can attach it to Molly, which is on my uh, on, on my uh, loadout vest right now, and and uh, belt clip. You know all the all the ways, all the things. You know, and uh, this is just I pulled it out of the out of actual attachment. And nice. So that's a good looking bayonet. The, yeah, this is the latest bayonet that uh, they issued with the um, with the AK-12s. Very nice. All I'll right. just add that to my uh, Grail acquisitions. There you go. Uh, so Bailey. Muller, and I ask you guys every episode, if you've got suggestions, you know, people you want us to have on a topic you want us to cover, email me, talking at gmail.com. And uh, Bailey took the opportunity, and he's got a, a pretty long list here. Uh, so it includes having Clay Co. back on, Clay Owens, uh, get Niels back on, James, which we have this episode, so there you go. Got James back on, uh, Brian Keeney, which, you know, we're working on. In, in his own time. Uh, Mishko. Does anybody know who Mishko? I've never heard of him. From, yeah, yeah, he's from YouTube. Yeah, he is a YouTuber. Okay. so very, very knowledgeable AK guy on YouTube. Does anybody know him? Can you guys I do know? not. Not personally? Okay, I don't I don't know him either. Um, let's see. Who else? Midwest Industry. So we'll get... Uh, Troy. 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 Yeah, he's been on before. We had him on a past episode. We'll get him back on again. See if see if we can't get him. You know I if he's going to be at NRA, be Marco. At, what's that? Do you know if he's going to be at NRA? No, he's not. He's not going to be there. Okay. He's not going to be there. But I think you should have him because he's got this alpha line. Um, oh yeah, 
Yeah, I definitely want to get uh, him on to talk about that. Yeah, I just got my set from him uh, last week. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. And uh, put it off, put it on uh, uh, the couple of the demo guns that I have. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll really get, good. We'll Very get you good. on with with uh, him with Troy. Maltov Manufacturing. You guys heard of Maltov Manufacturing? It's a new company making M-Lock pick rail handguards for the AK market. Sold on Kyber Customs website. Okay. So there's a another one. RS Regulate. I still haven't had them on. I've been... Oh, yes. Yeah, Scott is a good guy. Been meaning uh, to get him on. You got a connection with him? I do, but he's... Um... He works for one of the, I want to say it's either GM or Ford and stuff. Yeah. yeah. As their engineer. And he's just recently been promoted. And uh, he's, uh, I guess, I don't know how much time he has between or splits between the actually doing those uh, awesome side mounts and stuff. Yeah. Compared to his actual job. Well, so if, I'm not sure what his time. If you would ex is. extend an invitation to him to join us. On an episode, we'd love to have him on. Sure. Uh, and then he says, maybe look back at com block Soviet sidearms or PDWs uh, from the Nagant revolvers and Tokarovs to the Makarovs and the Stechins. I definitely want to talk about the Stechins. Uh, I have them all. I have all of them Stechins. Well, there you go. We could do a, we could do a whole episode on <laughs> on those. Uh, and he goes on and on. So uh, great suggestions there. And that's what I'm looking for. So if you guys have suggestions, people you want on, we'll do our best to get them on and, and talk about what you want to. Uh, let's see. You also get a lot of questions about 762 and 549 future. Maybe have some manufa ammo manufacturers on to talk about what the future looks like for, for those rounds. Your show is one of my favorites and I look forward to it every week. I hope you find my new suggestions helpful for future episodes. Also, maybe bring a leadhead range day or something to the West Coast. I would love to make the drive out to Moscow, Idaho, from where I live in Oregon. So there you go. We have talked about that several times. It's just hard to get everybody together and make that happen. But, yeah, great suggestions there. So thank you for the email, Bailey. And then we also got one. I got a message on Instagram, which I tell you not to send me this stuff on Instagram, but I just so happened to see it today and from Cody Atherley says, Hey lefty, just had an idea. Can you do an AK corner dedicated to the Draco? I have a 12 inch Romanian. Oh, <laughs> what? <laughs> excuse me. I, I, I'm going to excuse myself and leave now from the Draco. <laughs> <laughs> I have a 12 inch Romanian Draco with a Bone Steel Arms Brace, and it's definitely one of my favorite AKs. I think an episode of ded dedicated to different Dracos would be cool. Clayco would be a good guest for that one. Um, maybe not a whole episode on Dracos. You know, we might touch on them. And we've done it from time to time. We've talked about them uh, from time to time. But thank you, Cody, uh, for the message. Uh, but you guys email me, talkingletgmail.com, when you've got suggestions like that. Um, because if you send them to me on that, I, I usually tell you to email them to me anyway, but that I just happened to see that one today. So thanks to everybody who participated. We've got giveaways now that we want to do. i got to go back to my questions. And you already gave one patch away. Who did you give the patch to? That was to... Was it Esam? 87. Okay, so Esom, there's one of the patches, so he's one of our winners there. And how many patches are you giving away? Uh, we'll give away two, and then uh, if any of you guys want one, just holler at me after the, the podcast, and I'll get you guys hooked up. Okay, and you can uh, hit him up on the social meds, and it's 9-3 Tactical, all spelled out. N-I-N-E-T-H-R-E-E -E -E, Tactical uh, on the grams. Is that the best place for him to reach out to you? That, that would be the best place, yeah. Okay. So do that. So one one more pass. Let's give another patch away. What question did you particularly like, uh, Nikolai? 
Uh, let's go with uh, let's go with B. Hurst and the, uh, the differences in the bayonets. I, I learned quite a bit out of that, and uh, yeah. also film AK-12 bayonets. So. I think I feel like we could probably do a whole show on bayonets too. Oh, absolutely. Um, but I have them all too. And what? From the fr- I have them all. Oh, you have them all. Okay. Just, just line them up on a board and go through them. I dig it. All right, so uh, B. Hurst, you win the other patch. Do they get to choose which one they want? Yep. Yep. Okay. Hold so them up again. Far. Right now, I got the uh, the tan variant. I dig that one. I like that. Or the black. Very nice. Very nice. And then, uh, if I can get my machine to cooperate, I might have a couple of uh, gray ones too. So, well, don't tease them for stuff you don't have yet. So, I will. Those uh, are their choices, right there. I, by the time this airs, I should have one posted to Instagram. So, all right. And I and I forgot to mention our seal one. We're also giving away a seal one um, cleaning kit with uh, their clean lube and protect. Green engineered, safe for you, safe for the environment, uh, but it also keeps your firearms from corroding. This is good stuff. It's what I use. Have you gotten some of this yet, Marco? Uh, not yet. I'm uh, okay. I'll you s- know, I'm usually an uh, artist uh, customer. <laughs> you know, I mean, they take care of me really well. But um, yeah, I'm willing to try anything. Okay. It smells better than ballastol. It smells real good. James, you've got some, right? <laughs> you've got some of this, haven't you? I, I have not tried that yet, no. Okay, we'll hook you up, too. I'll, I'll, I'll get on that, yeah. I'll hook you up. Uh, so let's give the, the SEAL 1 away. And I think, where's he at? Ranger 1. That one Ranger 04. He asked what happened to East German after East Germany went bye-bye. And then he also um, thought that little banter between you and P-Man was was funny you win the seal one cleaning package that one ranger 04 email me talking at gmail.com need your uh address everybody got to have your address if you want to get this stuff so email me all right next let's give away the mission first tactical red smoke grenade here marco you want to pick the winner of that sure well, uh, gosh, it was just in my head um Oh, good Lord. I can't believe I just flew on my head. I'm very old, everyone. I'm very older old than you. Come on. And senile. Um, oh, God. I mean, I I wind up answering the most of that, of that question. Oh, yeah. About the about the uh, the AKs in the U.S. Okay. Yeah. Which one you would pick? Right. Gosh, I don't remember who answered that. Uh, or are you on Instagram? Yeah, I'm looking right now. So All right, I'll let you look for that one. So we'll come back to that. That That's going to be the winner of the M18 Mission First Tacticals uh, Red Smoke Drink thingy. Drinkware. They're awesome. All right, um, Factory 47. We're going to give away, you said, a Letty and a... Yeah, we'll give away a yeah tumbler and a, and a shirt. A Letty and do a you shirt. Wanna do, yeah, do you want to do the tumbler as the, uh, the talking lead tumbler and then the shirt as the East German? Yeah, we could do that. Okay. So you get so, a AK corner tumbler, Letty, I call them, goes to. Do you want me to pick it or you want this one? Uh, I'm going to pick uh, Bailey. Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to pick Bailey uh, Mueller because he did a question and he also sent me the email. So um, I'm going to reward the person who sent the email. So Bailey Muller Mueller, you are winning the Letty. The AK Corner Lady from Factory 47. And if you don't win anything from Factory 47 today, you can go to their website and you can use the code LEADHEAD, all lowercase, and you're going to get 10% off any of the items on James's website, Factory 47. So just a little reward for everyone. Yeah. All right, who's going to win the shirt? Love. Um, I'm not sure. I'm still scrolling here. If anyone's got one, throw it out there. We'll do this by committee since I always pick it. Let's see. I say let's reward Jerry Black because he's not participated in a while. So it's good to see him back in action. What do you say? 
Yeah, which what was his question? Do you have it there? Uh, Germany says they made so many AKs just leading up to the wall coming down. Where did they all go and follow up? Oh, yeah. To your knowledge, are they still in use today? Roger that. Yep, that's yeah. a good question. We had several people that asked, asked similar, um, but... Yeah. Let's go with uh, Jerry Black there. I think uh, I think it was ESM eighty seven that asked the uh, what's the AK is commonly available in the U.S. that you would consider to have other than Occam. It was uh, ESM. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, ESM, you can't win twice. So pick another winner for the the smoke. Wasn't there somebody that was kind of firing off uh, any mini questions and stuff? He he won one too. B uh, Hurst. Yeah. yeah. Let's go with the guy who sent me the uh, Instagram message. Cody Atherley. Oh. So you, you said something? don't send Instagram messages and then you're rewarding the guy who sends the Instagram messages? <laughs> well, I mean, he, he participated, so I'm just saying yeah, I don't yeah, always – just pick it at him. I don't you always speak. get to them, so your odds aren't good if you send it to me that way. <laughs> but his odds were obviously were pretty good, so – uh, I just wanted to call that out, but you definitely have to reward him because if you don't now, then he's going to think I'm mean. I know. Uh, <laughs> so he's going to get the uh, Mission First Tactical um, drinkware here. So email me, everybody who's a winner. Email me, talkingletgmail.com. I'm going to need your contact info, your email, not your email, but your uh, ad, mailing address. And shirt sizes if you want a shirt or something that requires a size. Yes. Was that everything? Is that everything we were giving away? Yes. Oh, Marco is going to give me away one of his uh, his Polish AKs. So I won that, ladies and gentlemen. He's he's sending me that bayonet. <laughs> what else? What else can I do? Uh, who who was speaking in? Hey, oh. I, you're going to sign my book. I'll send you my book. No, here here's the deal. Now, I'm glad you said Dude. that because we are going to be at. NRA. NRA and Indy, and we've told, we've been telling our listeners, and I made a post today, Marco, uh, that you're going to be there, uh, and you're going to be Shout signing be these. Yep, yep. And we we missed. we picked the day uh, and time. So I'll I'll mail mine right when you get back then. <laughs> <laughs> and if you guys want Marco to sign any of his books, or maybe you just want him to sign your your boobies, you know, you can come by the Caltech booth. Oh, hold on. Let me get my tickets to NRA. <laughs> <laughs> and Marco is going to be there. What do we decide? Saturday? Saturday, 10 to noon. Saturday, 10 to noon. And then he's going to be there the whole show. So if you run into him, uh, I'm sure he'll be happy to, to sign it. But he's specifically going to be at the booth. We want you to come by the Caltech booth, uh, which happens to be booth number, I think it's 8263. Let me just verify that. I just made like 10 posts today. 8263. That is it. 8263. Saturday, 10 to noon. Marco will be there signing books uh, and boobies. So come by. Say hi to us. Say hi to Marco. And then we're also giving away a nice, if I could get it up here, uh, P17 with a red dot. Uh, and a Kraken case, and it's going to have, I don't know, like five, six magazines. It's got a custom holster, uh, and it's got one of uh, Keltec's flashlights on there, like a 750 lumen uh, flashlight that's going to come with it. We're giving that away. You come by the booth, you register at the booth, um, and then we're going to be giving that away at the show. So make sure you uh, come by the booth and do that. Uh, but, yeah, that's... Uh, are you going to be at any other booths, Marco? Uh, yeah, I'll be at Pioneer Arms as well. Okay. Are you going to be there most of the time? Mm, no. We're still uh, hammering out uh, the times when I'm going to be there. Okay. Well, you can... You Problem can... Is, is like, a, you know, I mean, all of a sudden, remember last time we did the podcast, and there was only like one book left in the Amazon? Yeah, it was sold out because somebody emailed me and they're like, hey, there's no more books left. And you're like, oh, they got books. They lie. <laughs> yeah, they lie. There's, there's plenty of them available. No, somebody emailed me and said that they couldn't get one because they were out. Really? Yeah. When? 
just yesterday. after that after that podcast. Oh no, I mean since then. Oh, since then they've restocked. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's see, Amazon. Uh, okay. Let's just pull Let's it up see. here and just make sure. Amazon.com. Yeah. Um, the the shooter's guide is only one left, but uh, AK-47 uh, Survival and Evolution, twenty eight seventy five down from $35. So there ah, you there you go. It's, it's a bargain right now. <laughs> so you guys go do that. And then the gun... Uh, you know, I ordered that one, Marco. I ordered the gun digest, and I got put on a waiting list to get that. I still oh, haven't really? got that. Yeah, I haven't got it yet. So... Um, oh no, that uh, yeah, that the gun digest book is that the one you're talking about? The the yeah. shooters, yeah, gun digest yeah, shooters that, guide to AKs. Yeah, that's with your Kalashnikov USA rifle. They're in the same place. Is that what it is? <laughs> 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 yeah, just sitting there waiting on me. All right, guys, James, thank you so much for taking the time to be on. I really appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having me, guys. Go to factory47.com. Check out his blogs. He's going to start posting some more blogs. Uh, coming yes, up uh, and then he and i are also working on some projects for future uh, we can't really talk about yet uh, but be looking for that uh, and then uh, use the code leadhead get 10 percent off factory 47 uh, amazon to get marco's book they're in stock now uh, i don't know that you'll get them in time for nra but you might depending on where you live um, you might be able to get the book in time to bring it to nra to get marco to sign it I'm bringing mine because mine's not been signed. I'm, I've got that as my packing list. Uh, and then 93 Tactical, at 93 Tactical, all spelled out for Nikolai to get these awesome patches. And he does custom patches too. So um, I don't know what your your array of variety is. I mean, yeah, just holler at me and see what we can work up. Uh, if you do want to get into something uh, custom, I'm just – like texting you back and forth, Marty. We got that one hammered out in less than a day. So yeah, yeah, it's pretty quick, pretty quick stuff, and it's good work, good quality work. So you guys check Nikolai out uh, on his Instagrams there. And until the next episode, which is going to be next month, uh, be listening to the regular show because we're going to have a shit ton of interviews coming from NRA and giveaways. Uh, and we might open that giveaway to you that aren't attending, too. We haven't decided yet. But if you're going to be at NRA, come by and uh, get in on that giveaway. We've got T-shirts, custom-made T-shirts. Uh, and we're teasing a new Talking Lead logo. So that's coming also. Uh, that does it for this episode, guys. Thank you so much. Um, and until, what, what month is this? April? May? I want to see those emails from you, leadheads, talkingletgmail.com. Hit me up.